and our next keynoter is Nira Tandon. Nira is the president and CEO of the Center for American Progress and also the Center for American Progress Action Fund. She has served in leadership roles with President Obama and with former Secretary, Hillary, uh, uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. As I have said about each of our other presenters, I invite you to read the very impressive resume in the booklet. But what I would say about Nira, as I have said about others, is that she is an advocate, she is engaged, she is involved, and she is really super smart. <laughs> and what's more is, she's here. Please welcome Nira Tandon. Thank you. Uh, I'm very honored to be here to talk about uh, a set of issues that I think are, uh, should be at the forefront of the policy debates in our country, um, but also, if we want to be honest, are driving uh, so much of our politics. And, uh, and I think it's, it's vital that we try our hardest to address these issues head on in ways that we haven't for much of our history. So uh, I am going to talk about uh, racial inequality uh, in the United States, and I am particularly going to focus on the wealth gap between African Americans and uh, whites, wh white, uh, white families and African American families. And I think that is a critical topic to address uh, when we are thinking about uh, the anniversary of uh, 400, year, 400 years since the beginning of slavery because the racial wealth gap really is, the, in, in my view, one of the clearest manifestations of generational inequality that has developed because of our history with slavery. And so, I'll walk through that in, our, in my presentation, but uh, I, am, I really wanted to explain why at the beginning I'm going to talk about really that set of challenges. Now, over the last decade or so, I mean, obviously a long time, the United States has been talking about inequality. Uh, Thomas Piketty, others have been um, highlighting the deep uh, and systemic inequality in our country. Uh, and there is actually a real debate in progressive policy uh, between uh, race and class as the animating feature of inequality in the United States. And I am not here to argue that the United States does not have an incredible challenge of class. We obviously do. But we have seen uh, an important set of research over the last several years that really highlights how race is a more central feature than class. Uh, and I will dive into that research. Uh, it's highlighted by Raj Shetty, but others have built on it. And that research really demonstrates that it is easier to move between the lowest rungs, you know, lowest income quartiles in our country for whites than blacks, particularly for white men versus black men. And when you pull out all the reasons and all the features of that, uh, family structure, uh, uh, structure of neighborhoods, it really becomes clear that we have an issue of essentially racism driving that differential, which I will talk about in detail, but highlighting here. Uh, I think this is important, though, because even in the presidential debate, there is a, there is a bit of a discussion about race versus class. And that's why I think it is really vital that if we actually want to take on the inequalities in our country, we at least have to talk about both sets of structural, structural inequality, both race and class. And we won't truly address inequality until we get to race. Uh, and I think it's also clear from our politics that that is obvious, right? Because uh, if you see what's happening in our country, we see politicians who are dividing on race minute by minute, 
hour by hour, day by day. So uh, the first uh, slide is the uh, famous uh, description in the Constitution of uh, slaves as three-fifths people. Uh, our original document uh, was amended, but it is the original document that uh, organized the concept of African Americans as uh, less people. Uh, and then, you know, today, uh, hundreds of years later, we continue to see uh, deeply racially tinged, I even hate using that term, racism that comes from the highest leader of the land, the President of the United States, justifying or rationalizing uh, racial hatred. Racial hatred, anti-Semitic hatred, LGBTQ hatred, uh, misogyny, et cetera. And what does that have to do with where we are? So uh, today, the, one of the deepest inequalities uh, between the races is not income but assets. So white households today uh, have 10 times more wealth than black house, ha households at the median and six, time, six times more wealth on average. So what that means is uh, the median African-American, as you can see, African-American family has $17,000 of assets in the United States today. 171,000 for white families. My view, and I think the expert's view, is that that differential is a product of generational inequality. That what is happening, what has happened in the United States, is that white families have assets, have access to housing, have access to um, a whole series of assets mostly through housing, that has allowed them to pass on wealth from family to family. And that that wealth has been essentially inaccessible to African Americans. I know your previous panel talked about housing, but the, the systemic inequality in housing and redlining has meant that uh, African Americans, uh, the value of their homes over lifetimes have not uh, accelerated or accumulated in the same way that it has for whites. And this, I think, is the, a, a central challenge of how we actually get true equality. Because when we look at you know, children born today, an African-American child born today, they have, that child will have fewer resources because the family has fewer resources, because there's less assets for that family to call upon when the child is born. And so that's how we get uh, inequality that basically accelerates generation to generation and why it's really vital that we actually have policies to address these challenges. And what's exciting, which I'll get to in a little bit, is that actually in the presidential debates and the political discourse, there are, have been, has been a discussion of ideas that would address the wealth gap. Um, these, just to go through a little bit more on these issues, the racial housing gap exists in every state. I know your previous panel talked about housing, but just as an example, in Wisconsin, only 29% of black households own their homes versus 76 of white households. Owning a home is the way in which it is easiest to pass on wealth generation to generation. So when African Americans don't own, their, own a home, that means assets uh, will not pass on. Uh, and the home ownership gap exists even after controlling for factors of education and income. Uh, and what I think is, is truly a disturbing and distressing fact is that college educated black households are less likely to own their own homes than white households who have never graduated from high school. And we'll see in, 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 uh, this research that uh, Raj Shetty has done uh, that 90% of communities, American communities, young black men experience lower rates of upward mobility than young white men who grow up in the exact same neighborhoods. And, and as I said earlier, you, we can't attribute this to just parental marriage rates or education or even assets even though there is a big asset gap, even assets, when you control for assets, white men will have much higher mobility rates than black men. 
there are so, actually, I mean, there are the, the note of good news is there's less of a differential between white women and African American women, but part of that reason is because white women still face <laughs> Uh, misogyny and sexism. So white women, both white women and black women are still uh, highly unequal to white men. So, and this is, I think I, I want to focus on this for one second because when you look at inequality in our country, this fact really needs to stand out. It is much easier for a white man who is in the lowest income bracket to move up over his life than it is for any other group. And it is hard to attribute that to anything other than essentially the status and privilege of being a white man. So this is something we have to address as a country to get to true equality. Uh, this just is a, this is just is a demonstration that is, is actually not related to parental uh, structure. It's a, there's a lot of discussion of parental structure. And you see in this data that actually uh, there still is a there is still a gap between um, African American male children in single parent families and white male children in single parent families, and the same holds true in two parent families. So regardless of family structure, uh, you still see this replicated uh, this replicated uh, mobility challenge, and I think this is. Um, why we uh, have to, again, face these problems head on uh, when you see, and these are just additional statistics around these facts, that it's easier for uh, an African-American man or African-American children born into the top 20% to fall out of that income group than uh, it is for other groups. Um, and we'll get to this statistic right here, which shows that 20%, um, 18% of black children born into households in the top 20% stay there, and 40%, double, of white children stay in that income bracket. So how do we, cha how do we address these challenges? Obviously, we, we have a real challenge with racism, and there is multiple ways in which that racism manifests itself. Uh, and I think the discussion around criminal justice and the fact that our criminal justice system is one that uh, massively is massively punishes African Americans is a is a critical issue. But if we really want to get at how we address these inequalities over the long term, we have to have, in my view, bold policies that directly ad address this issue of the wealth gap itself. It is hard in the United States to have true equality if there is such a differential on assets between families. Because a family with few assets is much more subject to economic harm, uh, any kind of uh, particular episode of economic dislocation. It's just much harder to be resilient in any situation like that, a bankruptcy, a job loss, if you don't have assets to uh, come back on or uh, rely on. So that is why we think uh, at the Center for American Progress that we need to have uh, a bolder set of ideas around these challenges and why we think that progressive policymakers should really think through the idea of targeted universalism. Targeted universalism really means policies that are universal but recognize uh, in, in them that uh, there are particular challenges that have manifested themselves by race. And so uh, when you think about something like making college free, which is an important, an important issue, you should also recognize that college itself today is very racially skewed. Whites go to college at a much higher rate than African Americans and Latinos. So if you make college free, you are still, I mean, you, it's, it's important to do because African Americans and Latinos have fewer assets when they are in college, so it definitely benefits them. But you are already benefiting a relatively privileged group because it is already skewed who's going to college. So it is vital that we also think through policies to get, I think, at this asset gap 
for families so that we uh, give all families the ability to actually move up the economic income scale in a much more equal way. And what are some ideas to do that? Uh, one idea is to, is to literally build assets for young people. So uh, baby bonds is an idea. Uh, this is a, in the presidential debate. Uh, Cory Booker has proposed baby bonds. And baby bonds are a relatively simple idea, which is that you give uh, essentially resources. It could be $1,000 up to $2,000 uh, per year. Uh, for each child until they're 18, uh, and, and but that's the targeted universalism, as, uh, universalism aspect of that is that you recognize that lower income families should have more resources than higher income families. So maybe for a low income family, uh, each child gets $2,000, and for upper income family, maybe they get $500. So everyone's able to build assets, but you're recognizing that there is this. Uh, there is this inequality that exists, and instead of replicating that inequality, you're trying to undo that inequality. Uh, over the life of, uh, over the life uh, of, um, if we were to implement baby bonds today, uh, we would reduce the racial wealth gap by 30% uh, by 2070. I mean, this is like a long-term strategy. It's not easy. It's not the only thing to do, but it is one of the biggest ways you could actually tackle the issue of uh, wealth inequality. Uh, another idea is a national savings plan. Uh, today, African-American households uh, have much lower uh, retirement rates uh, in addition to Social Security. Obviously, everyone gets Social Security, but their ability to uh, save is much lower. So there's a 37.5% uh, of working age black households have retirement savings account in addition, accounts in addition to Social Security. Uh, it's almost double that for white, 65.9%. Uh, we have proposed a national savings plan, and that would increase the retirement program participation among black households by nearly 30%. A national savings plan is very simple. It is essentially that uh, it is, it, it's the United States itself replicating uh, retirement savings accounts by putting uh, additional money away. Uh, in the only real difference between that and Social Security is that you get the benefit of the market return, um, which has been higher than Social Security. So that's another idea. Uh, and I really do want to get to questions. Uh, so I will be, I'm going to run through this, which is uh, one of my uh, favorite ideas because uh, universal child care, uh, which uh, we do not have in the United States, and uh, I should note, most of the Western world, most of developed countries, uh, have universal child care proposals. The United States is unique in the world in that we spend very, very little money as a country at the state, federal, or local level on children zero to five. We spend a fair amount, five to 18, uh, and, and, and less, but still a significant amount, um, from 18 to 22, but if you look at the racial gaps, the fact that we spend so little money at zero to five basically is another way in which uh, African American families uh, face struggle because it is when your family, you know, people have children in the earlier stages of their professional work and their career life. If you have few assets at that moment, then you have fewer assets to give your child. And that is why we see such differentials between children even when they come to school. So to address that inequality, both racial and in income inequality, a universal program that actually ensured that all children were ready on grade at first grade would mean that when children face the true fork in the road, in their lives, which is if a child is not reading on grade by third grade, their outcomes tend to be much lower than if they are. And that's why ensuring that we are investing zero to five is so crucial for life outcomes. So these policies uh, are designed, it's a nice thank you at the end of this. Uh, yeah, these policies are designed uh, to try to get at the central challenge we face, which again is in our politics and we see it every day, that 
uh, we have the most systemic inequality in the United States is between African Americans and white families. And unless we have a plan to actually address that inequality, we will see it continually replicated from generation to generation. And we will continue to, in my view, see the kind of uh, disruptive politics and disillusionment that is uh, creating uh, so much of the horribleness from the place that I work every day, which is Washington, DC. So with that, I would love to take questions and, uh, uh, and, and really uh, get your perspective. So thank you. Should, okay, great. Um, you said everybody oh, a microphone's coming. Great. Um, you said everybody gets Social Security, but they don't. Yeah, that's true. That's um, true. Domestics, farm workers were designed out, and um, those populations are largely people of color. So that reinforces the, the gap. So I think yeah. we have to be aware of that, um, you know, because that floor isn't there for a lot of people. That's an excellent point uh, that I was overgeneralizing about. I would say that Social Security itself has helped reduce some of the inequalities because it is a universal program, even with the holes. It is a big challenge. I mean, the, the bigger challenge in Social Security uh, if you're just looking at gaps, is between women and men because of the ways the Social Security program is structured. But what's different about that is that throughout, I mean, uh, there are a lot of bills and proposals in Congress to deal with those gaps. And there we've seen fewer uh, bills in some of these areas. So we face a whole series of inequalities, and we have a series of inequalities within programs that exist like Social Security. I'm just pointing out that those inequalities uh, are larger in, in when we choose not to do anything in an area. Right, go ahead. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. And I noticed in it you used a lot of uh, statistical data. Yes. And um, uh, I re recently attended a conference in um, August on rethinking social justice which uh, presented scholars who are um, uh, African-American, most of them, and the subject of data collection mm -hmm. um, was a, um, a force of the conference in terms of doing culturally relevant <coughs> collection of data that is applied to communities um, that highlight their strengths rather than their weaknesses, um, but being objective at the same time. Uh, Yashi Miller was one of mm -hmm. the uh, collectors of that information, and um, it, it seems that there is this uh, a f this impact that they want to have on uh, public policy formation based on real data, um, not that yours is not, I'm mm -hmm. not um, saying that, but I just want to know your opinions on how that will affect the going uh, forward of how we view the inequities. Yeah, so I think that's a really important point. Um, a lot of this data comes from uh, uh, income and tax uh, data that the IRS collects. And you know, the fact that we are in 2019 and it's really over the last five years that we've seen this work, uh, Rod Shetty has highlighted as, as, as the pioneer and others are working off of it, I do b think basically condemns how little we've done over a long period of time. Um, because you know this 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 information on mobility and the lack of mobility based on race or the differential on economic mobility based on race is something that we should have been able to understand in the 70s, 80s, 90s, aughts, and uh, it shouldn't have really taken into the 2010s to to get us to that space. And I think even Raj would say, uh, Professor Chetty would say, um, that there's a lot more that we need to understand around communities and how, uh, and the interaction of assets in communities. So, you know, the, the fact is in that when you say in 99% of places, being a white person with low income means mobility moves much faster, 
we still have to understand why that happens and what the differentials are in different communities. And there are communities in which uh, African American families are, African American children, mobility rates are higher than in other places. And we actually, there's a lot of work to do to understand what are the structures that are actually creating that. Is it schools? Is it assets of the family? Is it social networks? And so I think, uh, I'm answer, it's taking a long time, but I will just say, you're absolutely right that there's a lot more we need to understand, and there's a lot more we need to understand at the community level about what is actually helping uh, mobility rates, particularly for families of color. I'm good, I'll go here, and then we'll go. Okay, great, okay, then we'll, okay, so we'll do, right go there, and then I'll head over there. Or you, you, I, I don't, you, someone else can just tell me where to go. Okay. Hi. Um, I just want to mention that you mentioned zero to five, and I think it's important to say that that's when all of the brain plasticity and brain building takes place. Mm -hmm. So that further exacerbates um, what we're talking about in terms of disparities. Yes. The, uh, amen, sister. Uh, uh, I was kind of rushing through it, but zero to three, uh, and really zero to two, we are learning more and more um, is where we have the most rapid brain development. So, I mean, it's it's as a country, we actually spend the most money on a human, on a person, a, a, an American, uh, from the age 65 and older. Uh, but if we're actually trying to reduce uh, inequalities, racial uh, and income inequality, we would invest much more in zero to five. And as a country, we we. Not only do we not invest in zero to five, we don't have paid leave programs, uh, national paid leave programs. We don't have, uh, as I said, universal child care. We do very little uh, for children at the time where those inequalities can be life determinative. And that's why I think child care is such a vital issue. But I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pleased to say that most of the presidential candidates have embraced a universal child care proposal, Senator Warren was the first, CAP has had a universal child care proposal for five years, even, uh, not even, I shouldn't say even, Sec Senator, uh, Secretary Clinton, when she was running for president, also embraced universal child care. So it is just a, it's just an issue of getting it done. I'm gonna call, you let me know. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, so I'd like to thank you for a presentation in which you connected concepts to policies and inequality and systemic equality and in particular, the black-white income gap. So then I was looking at all other kinds of inequalities. Mm -hmm. I was then looking at the policies and waiting to sort of see policies that seem to address structural things rather than particular things. I'd like to suggest that you add to the list of policies mm -hmm. reparations. Mm -hmm. yeah. And. I say the word and it probably evokes some things we're not sure. What I'm suggesting is I think it is time for people who do serious policy work to think about how do we get significant sums of money to address this intergenerational poverty, uh, to address these things that it's not just, you know, child care savings plans and things talk about particular symptoms. But we need to have on your list of policy options that people are studying in a serious way things that address macro and structural. And yeah. I think one of the places you should start is reparations. Yeah, so that that is a great point. And I think I, we're doing work now uh, to actually understand or to think through how to devise a reparations policy. Right now, there are bills in Congress and lots of candidates have supported the idea of an examination, so a study. So we're actually trying to do uh, an analysis. And I didn't place it up here because we, we ne neither we nor others have thought through or have proposed the exact manner and structure of how you do a reparations program. But we, I agree with you that that is an important part of how we address this set of challenges. Whether you do it like a baby bond structure, you could run a reparations program through that or some other vehicle, but I agree with you on that point. Hi. Um, oh, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, I, I, one, I'm, I'm, I'm going over time, but yes, go ahead, and I'll, it'll be my last question. Okay. Uh, you, 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 I'm sorry. You were talking about the, the things that would drive an inequality in America, and 
the solutions you gave were all um, sort of, I felt like band-aids that mm -hmm. were sort of addressing, you know, solutions to sores, but not really digging deep into, you know, the structural issues that, you know, the structural issues that are affecting our country. And I think that it, you didn't mention education. You mentioned mm -hmm. universal child care, free college, national savings plans, but that still did not deal with structural racism in this country. Back in 1972, I, I had an older mm -hmm. white female approach me and express her exasperation and frustration, and I said, what are you upset about? I passed by the unemployment line. There were white men in the unemployment line, and she was really physically upset because her expectation was everyone else could be in the unemployment line, but not white men. And I think until we, as a country, address sort of this structural racism, there will still always be the expectation of you may have universal child care, you may have free college, you may have the, but you know what? You, you know, if, you're, if the expectation is that you will be the last hired and the first fired, it's not going to get to solving the, the structural problems that exist in our society. Yeah, so I think this is a really important issue, and I want to take it head on. Uh, the research shows people are discriminated against, and we should stop that discrimination. It's obvious, we know it, we see it every day, very clear. But, and so there's a variety of things to do about that, but w what's happened is that while people are facing that discrimination, African-American families have an asset gap that just makes it much harder for African-American families to weather economic storms. And so I am not point, I I'm, I'm agree wholeheartedly. We have to deal with the fact that people are discriminated against. But while we do that, we shouldn't ignore the asset differential between families because it makes it much harder to weather any issue, a job loss because you're African-American or you're stopped by the police because you're African-American. And so, I should have said this at the beginning, absolutely, we have to end discrimination, we have to improve our schools, we have to do all those things. But if we let all those things happen and we replicate the asset gap that exists, we are still going to face a fundamental structural inequality between fam between these two things between these two between whites and blacks. I really I I mean I would hope you're right about that, but I would say the issue what I, my I'm positing is slavery and generational inequality will replicate themselves for centuries unless we deal with this asset challenge head on. And it's because, you know, honestly, I think that we have a racism problem. A manifestation of that is people don't want to adopt targeted universalism and pro programs that deal with these issues. So I, I would just respectfully say it's both issues. It's not just one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Neil.